so somebody needs to, sorry for that. Somebody needs to put up my presentation. So let's see whether it will work. But while this is done, I can tell you what I'm going to tell you. And I also need the other clicker, please. Uh, so let's see. So first of all, I changed my title to Climate Change, Public Health, and Social Peace. So in the beginning, we talked about the direct and indirect effects of climate change already happening and in the future. So I, was, so I will be talking, of course, about extreme events, actually extreme events of the first kind, where there is a hurricane, of the second kind, if, for example, the entire Indian summer monsoon might be disrupted, that would be certainly uh, uh, an extreme event of much less manageable dimension. And the third thing is, when I relate this to not just immediate human suffering, but migration driven by extreme events, for example, which in the end will even lead to armed conflicts, then of course you need to ask yourself, is there anything we can do about it? Because as we just learned, if we clean up the air, uh, closing all fired, coal-fired power stations, we will have even more global warming, for a while at least. Uh. So, two degrees warming is more or less within the system already. Of course, in the Paris Agreement, there is this aspirational goal of keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees, which from the point of view of climate impacts makes a lot of sense. Actually, it means the survival of some island states. With two degrees, they will not survive. But getting there is extremely important. So we have to brace ourselves also for how to adapt to a two degree warmer world. Not to even speak about four or six or eight degrees. So I talk about f first, and let me see whether this here works. Uh huh. Somehow. Ah, let me see. You are right. And it works, but I have to go back. Okay. Here we go. I get need to get used to the Vatican technology, of course. Sorry. Go now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now. <coughs> the chair instructed me. So, 2017, in a sense, what the Queen of England once said a few years ago was an annus horribilis, really. She referred to something else, of course. So we had record storms, record downpours, record floods, record heat waves, record wildfires. I'll just give you a few impressions here. So Irma, which was supposed to wreak havoc on Florida, it was not that bad in the end. But this was clearly the most powerful storm on record over the open Atlantic. Uh, and if it would not have, towards the end, have taken a turn to uh, make landfall uh, on Florida, it would have been a tremendous disaster. This was a disaster, in fact, so Hurricane Harvey, and you see this is the precipitation map. And it simply said that East Houston received more than 40 inches of rain within three days. This is unprecedented, and I'll come back to that later. There's a physical reason for that. We had in Nepal, all across South Asia, record floods. And this probably was not noticed by the world, but in the Iranian city of Avas, uh, this summer, 54 degrees centigrade were approached. And if you go down uh, this uh, figure caption here, the felt temperature in a neighboring city of Bandal, Emashar, approached 74 degrees centigrade because you had a humidity of 90 percent, uh, which is unbearable, actually. You cannot survive under these conditions in the outside. Huh? So this was not noticed by the world, but this was, of course, close to human disaster. This is better known, heat waves and forest fires across Europe. In particular, you had this heat wave called Lucifer. I also experienced in August, I was here in Italy. You had in Florence 40, 42 degrees and so on. It did not rain since May, actually. And 
well known to the world, the forest fires in Northern California. But here's a really interesting one. You know, for the first time, there was a major hurricane moving eastwards, formed in the Atlantic, called Ophelia. It was a category three hurricane, and it did not catch up with the western wind belt, but it really moved to the east. Finally ended as a tropical storm in Ireland, killed three people there, I guess. But the real consequence was, because this was a tropical storm in the end, or a subtropical storm actually, uh, turning uh, counterclockwise, so it moved so much hot air from Africa to the Iberian Peninsula that you had these major wildfires again, uh, and more than 40 people died. Uh. So you see the indirect effects of a major extreme event can be even more deadly in the end. We feel the heat of climate change now. People often say, well, you cannot really sort of see the signal in the noise, but we clearly see it. This is about the percentage of land area with exceptionally high temperatures. And we do it in one sigma, two sigma, three sigma, you know, standard deviation. And what you see is the one sigma events go up like hell, actually. It's the green line, even the two sigma. And the three sigma, this is something which under uh, standard statistical conditions would happen every thousand years or so on, is also going up. Uh, so we see the signal in the noise, absolutely. And we climate scientists are often ask if there is a major extreme event, is this directly related to global warming? And now we can do this, actually. Yeah? So we can go through all this extreme event and can say, well, Lucifer was four times more likely because of global warming. Uh, the forest fires in Portugal were 10 times more likely. And uh, ocean acidification, the bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef was 175 75 times more likely because of human interference. So you can one by one go through all these events and assign a statistical relevance. Huh? Harvey Irma and the rise of extreme events. You see this is uh, global warming, so to speak, and uh, temperature going up, and this is how heavy precipitation is going up. They go actually hand in hand. This is due to the so-called Clausius-Clapeyron relationship with basic physics. It's happening. And this is the prediction for more extreme rainfall if we increase the temperature of the world. You see, it's going up per degree of warming centigrade, that is, by 15%. You can now pick your favorite region here. That means, by the way, it does not mean that we have less droughts. It simply means even in regions which tend to become drier, you still have more heavy precipitation effects. Huh? So the events come, the downpours come in very few events, which is not good news, actually. Huh? Change in heat-related excess mortality, I leave that to the experts here, but I want to bring up, it was shown before or something similar, that is Mora et al. in Nature Climate Change. This is about the risk of conditions that exceed human thermal regulatory capacity. It's the weld bulb temperature thing, which was mentioned already. And simply it means if you go to the dark red, color coding, and it says that in the region where you have a stock red, in almost 350, that means all year round, you have conditions where you cannot survive outside without air conditioning because of the combination of humidity, heat stress, and so on, even if you are windy conditions and so on. And you can pick the regions now. This is under business as usual, of course. Uh. So it means huge part of the tropics become uninhabitable, full stop. Gl global sea level rise, this is the observation. The latest predictions are by the year 2100. We might even have actually 1.3 meter sea level rise. Why are we correcting those contributions ups, upside, uh, upwards all the time, because now we include 
the melting of the S East Antarctic Ice Shield, which is starting in the West Antarctic Ice Shield, come to that later. So that means if the whole global population would stay put, then 1.4 billion people would be affected by 2060. Of course, people will out-migrate, of course. Uh, but you see, this is the huge proportion of the human population that will be affected by sea level rise already in 40 years from now. This is a global migration cartoon. Now you can see how people move into, say, Brazil, outward of Brazil, out of West Africa, and so on. This is what we did for the Asian Development Bank. I recently presented that in Manila. So these are the cartoons of migration from Bangladesh, uh, from Vietnam, from the Philippines, and so on. Every policymaker should be aware of these cartoons. Almost nobody is aware of that. Now I tell you two stories about migration, climate-driven migration. One is almost comical, the other one is deeply disheartening. So the first one is Hurricane Maria's impact on Puerto Rico wiped out within eight hours human development or economic development, that is, Palfa, uh, of 15 years. So 21% of GDP were destroyed within one night, more or less. What does it mean? It means that more Puerto Rican will consider to move to Florida, where you have already a major population. Uh, you know Leonard Bernstein, uh, East Side Story, West Side Story, actually. But what will it do? Florida is a swing state. Puerto Ricans tend to vote Democratic. If a million of Puerto Ricans would move to Florida, this would have a major impact on the next American election. So this is the ultimate revenge of climate change to Donald Trump. <laughs> so that's the funny story. This is the sad story. Uh, this is New York Times, 26th of October. You can look it up for yourself. I was really, I was extremely depressed when I looked it up. Uh, so it's a sequence of, of video clips, so to speak. The uninhabitable village in southern India where many farmers kill themselves because of the drought. Uh? Even if the monsoon is strong, there are regions where there is no water, actually. Uh? And you couldn't go through that, and I recommend it to everybody. We talked about uh, sort of communications, and you can go. This is the story of about this woman. Her husband killed himself because of the drought. And when this is being debated, what can you do about it? not only praying. These are the regions in India, Ram knows much more about that, of course, where this is happening. I lost my husband's life and the harvest. What are people doing? So, this is the girl. They are staying because they cannot move away. But what they can do, so if you go through the sequence, what they can do is they can send, actually, their son to a factory, a rice mill, a cotton mill. This is back-breaking work, actually, somewhere to send money back to them, actually. That's the only way to survive in that village. And so you can go through this. And finally, of course, some people wait. And what they do is, these are skulls of farmers who killed themselves because of the drought, exposed in, in Delhi here. Huh? This is a gruesome story. But this is the only means of communication these people still have. And I just want to read this out to you. To us, the field is God. I'm not angry with the land. I'm only angry at my husband because he killed himself. This is the story, New York Times, 26th of October. So let me move now to what it means in the end. So if people either stay put or if they leave, like we did it from Syria, of course this type of migration will create all types of conflicts. Huh? 
So this is a picture from the exodus of, from Rwanda during the genocide. We did a paper on there's a six significant contribution of climate shocks to armed conflicts. This is significant uh, in statistical terms, but in particular in ethnically fractionalized countries. So if you have a country where you have different tribes, different ethnicities and so on, when the climate shock will actually create in the end armed conflict. So it's very important to make this distinction. Now the second times of extreme events, these are my tipping points, so to speak. If, for example, now the Fermilion circula circulation, the Indian summer monsoon, El Nino, the big ecosystems like the Amazon rainforest and the great ice sheets get disrupted by climate change, then all the things I told you about extreme events will be multiplied by a factor of 10 or 20 or 100. Huh? And actually, this is a map we showed in Nature Climate Change just uh, last year. And, and you need to, in a way, memorize this chart uh, because it's the chart of our century here. Because the line, the wiggly line below is how we emerged from the last ice age. The Holocene, which was shown already by Ram before, 11,000 years ago, we invented agriculture. And on the right-hand side, you see the various scenarios for the future. If everything goes right, the green line would apply and we would stop global warming be one below 1.5. Now the gray, yellow, uh, the gray bar, the horizontal bar, that's the, the Paris corridor. We want to land our planet there. And finally, you see on the right-hand side, the red line is business as usual, RCP 8.5. And the items you see there are the error bars for the various tipping elements. So, West Antarctic ice sheet coral reefs. And now there are two lessons to be uh, taken home from that. The first one is we can avoid many of these disruptive accidents in a planetary system still if we stick to Paris. But there's one group which would already be unleashed even if we stay below two degrees, including the loss of coral reefs. So in a way, we are coming too late, at least two decades too late for that. But that does not mean we should give up on Paris, quite to the contrary. So my final remark is the following. If two degrees warming is almost unavoidable, but we should stop global warming there, what is if we like the counterpart to a global mitigation goal, in my view, it's managed migration, and that has been an issue everywhere across the planet right now, in Europe, in the United States, in Asia, and so on. And uh, just a few thoughts what we might do, and I know this is completely out of the mainstream, but let me go ahead nevertheless. Manage global migration in a two degrees world, and it would mean, for example, we would have to have immigration quota. So every country would have to take up refugees according to their historical contribution to global warming. So for the US, it would mean take up 25% of all climate migrants. Next one would be something like a Nansen passport. And I switch now to this. He's one of my personal heroes, Fritjof Nansen. He more or less invented polar research. Uh, he received the Peace Nobel Prize. And he proposed this one here, this passport, become, because he became a diplomat later after the First World War. That means a passport, people who lose their home, like from small island states, would get a sort of global passport. And actually, after the First World War, it was accepted by more than 60 nations. So if you held the Nansen passport, you could go to this country and work there and have a living. Eh? So this is something we should consider. Do we need a Nansen climate passport, actually? And finally, you need something like, we might call it, let me see, a global green card. So everybody who is driven out of his home by climate change would nevertheless have a chance to make a living in some country. So I end here.
with my personal hero, Fritjof Nansen, who proposed this a long time ago after the disasters of the First World War, but maybe it's more timely than ever to consider this in the 21st century. Thank you very much. <laughs>